So you've got kids in the clan and cash in your pocket, and it's time to buy a nice new car. Like most Australians, you're probably not thinking about a people mover, but instead considering one of these, a seven seat family SUV. Families are increasingly gravitating towards this sort of car. Taking a different approach with this group, we decided to compare high-end models that cost around $60,000 plus on-road costs. Looking at the Toyota Kluger GXL, Kia Sorento GT line, Hyundai Santa Fe Highlander, and Mazda CX-8 Azaki. All four are loaded up with leather trim, sat-nav heated seats, and other handy features such as autonomous emergency braking and active cruise control. Price from $58,950 plus on-road costs, the Toyota Kluger GXL stands alone with its petrol V6 engine. It's the most powerful car in this group, but it also uses the most fuel. Toyota backs the Kluger with a modest three-year warranty, though it wins points by being the cheapest to service by some margin. If you want a strong warranty, Kia's seven-year guarantee is very hard to beat. Price from $58,990 plus on-road costs, the Kia Sorento GT line uses a 2.2-litre turbo diesel engine to drive all four wheels through an eight-speed automatic transmission. The Sorento brings plenty of kit thanks to a midlife update. Stuff like heated and ventilated seats, Apple CarPlay and a strong safety suite. Like its Hyundai cousin, Kia does not claim to offer third row airbag coverage for its seven seat SUV, normally a serious omission when weighing up this sort of car. But the airbags do stretch to cover glass elements in the third row, which the ANCAP safety body says is adequate, if not ideal. The Hyundai Santa Fe Highlander sits at the top of the brand's SUV range. Priced from $60,500 plus on-road costs, the Santa Fe shares its turbo diesel engine and all-wheel drive system with its Korean sibling, the Sorento. You could argue that the Santa Fe features more kit than any other car here, backed by an impressive five-year warranty and cheap servicing costs second only to the Toyota. It might be the car to beat, as long as you're cool with divisive front-end styling that looks better in the metal than photos. Priced from $61,490 plus on-road costs, the Mazda CX-8 Azaki is the most expensive car in this group. It's similar to the CX-5 in size, but powered by a 2.2-litre turbo diesel engine that makes it the most efficient car in this quartet. Mazda has built some cracking SUVs lately, and this promises to be the best of both worlds, blending key attributes from larger and smaller models. Though it may be the lightest car in the group, the CX-8 is a heavyweight when you drink in the details. Our test examples white leather, genuine wood and luxury car style rotary controller really do lend premium appeal to the new Mazda, even if you would be mad to choose this colour combo with kids on board. CX-8 almost feels like a luxury car thanks to a digital climate control panel with seat heater controls in the back of the car. It also has clever USB points hidden in the centre armrest, though that's not as convenient when you've got three people in the back as nobody gets power and it also has a pronounced transmission tunnel that gets in the way of your feet. Access to the rear row is quite simple and it's clever to see that Mazda has used carpet here instead of white leather which would be easily scuffed by small passengers. In the back the seats are very straightforward although once again there isn't reclining adjustment for these and they miss out on rear air vents. CX-8 makes up for that with the largest boot capacity of our group, easily accepting a vertical case with the tailgate shut. The Santa Fe is the next most luxurious car here, with excellent features such as quilted brown leather seats and a head-up display system usually offered by the likes of BMW. While it may be more premium than before, Hyundai certainly has not forgotten its roots. The Hyundai Santa Fe was clearly designed with families in mind. There's plenty of space for passengers, as well as twin USB points and outlets for the rear. But my favourite feature are one-touch buttons that kids can use to access the third row. Simply touch a button and it opens up a channel through to the back seat. Now back here, pulling the sixth and seventh seats is really easy. You just grab the handle and fold them up. There's plenty of room in the cargo bay with five seats on board, but with the seventh seats in place, the car only just accepts our standard size cabin luggage. By comparison, the Sorento lacks an element of polish, as well as equipment such as the heads-up display and inductive wireless charging pad offered by the Hyundai. The Sorento has some clever touches, including a choice of 12 volt or USB power, seat heaters and air vents for the back seat. It's not the roomiest back here, and when you fold the seats forward, the space to get through to the rear is a little tighter than some of the others. But when you pop around the back, this car has quite large seats in the back that adults could use from time to time. That said, there's no reclining adjustment for the back seat. And as you can see, with the seven seats in place, cargo room can be a little bit squeezy in the back of the Sorento. Unlike the other three cars, the GXL is not the flagship model in the Kluger range, an honour that belongs to the Grande. Inside the Toyota, hard plastics contribute to a budget-minded feel, which also misses out on front parking sensors, a 360-degree camera and 10-speaker stereo fitted as standard to these three rivals. 
but it is quite roomy. The Toyota Kluga has the most space of our contenders, feeling like a modern SUV alternative to the Tarago People Mover in the back seat. It's great to see dedicated air vent controls for the rear, though it loses points for a single 12 volt power outlet that isn't a USB type. It's also a bit tricky to access the third row, requires more muscle than kids might like to muster. When you pop around the back, it requires one handle to pull the seat in place, and then a second handle to get it into a comfortable position. That is fiddlier than we'd like to see. There's a decent amount of cargo room back here, with five seats or seven seats in place. Though, as you can see, the tailgate is very slow on the Kluger. Now, it does have one key advantage over its competitors, and that is a pop-out glass tailgate, which allows access to the cargo area, which is very handy on a day-to-day -day basis. Time to hit the road. We drove the contenders in a mix of urban, suburban, and motorway conditions, finding strong points in each model. The Santa Fe rides on the same platform as the Sorento and uses the same turbo diesel engine, which is a little noisier than you'd hope. You can hear there's a bit of a bit of a swirl and grumble to it, but on the whole, it's not too bad, and it offers plenty of punch. There's lots of torque from that turbo diesel engine, which has a fine partner in its eight-speed automatic transmission. Now, while it rides on the same platform, the Hyundai has a more sporty tune than the Kia. You can feel that a little bit over bumps. It feels just a tad tauter, but when you tip into corners, it feels that as well. The Hyundai feels a little bit more honed and precise and more of a driver's tool than its cousin, the Kia. It is quite actually a bit of fun to drive. The new Santa Fe, it's got excellent poise and you can really feel that the work that Hyundai has put into sorting this thing out for local conditions. You know, you come into a roundabout and change directions and it just feels nimble and agile, which you don't really expect from a car this size. I'm actually quite surprised by the Hyundai and really quite impressed as to how it handles on the road. The Toyota Kluger stands out for two reasons. One is that it is the biggest car in this group and it certainly feels it on the road. Second is that it has a strong petrol V6 engine that really likes to sing. It's a very powerful engine, and definitely the most powerful one here, and it really feels quite punchy on the road. It's a smooth, sonorous engine that I really enjoy. However, it is thirsty. It uses so much more fuel than the diesel rivals here and has a much shorter range as a result. So it really is a compromise. Do you want that sweet, sweet engine or do you want a car that goes further for longer and costs less to run? Bit of a tough one. The Kluger is made in America, which is no surprise. This is a very American feeling car. It's huge, it's spacious, it has a great engine and it is just a little bit sloppy to drive in the corners. When you come up to a corner in the Kluger and have to change directions, it does feel quite heavy. It feels like the more than two ton of big American SUV that it is, but that doesn't really matter. This isn't a sports car. This isn't something that you drive on a Sunday morning to get your thrills around a racetrack or something like that. It's a big family bus and it does an outstanding job of what it is supposed to be doing. The Mazda CX-8 is something of a greatest hits catalog from the brand's SUV department, blending the turbo diesel engine and chassis of the smaller CX-5 with the seven seat layout of the larger CX-9. But not everyone wants to drive a massive seven seat SUV like the CX-9, and so this might be the answer. It might be the sweet spot for a lot of young families. While the other cars in this category have eight speed automatic transmissions, the Mazda only has a six speed, but it doesn't feel too bad out on the open road. And in fact, it is reasonably quiet, particularly under load. There's none of that diesel rattle and clatter that you usually get from engines of this type. Mazda has done a great job damping that and keeping it down. They've also reduced the road noise in this car, making it feel more like the bigger CX-9 than the smaller CX-5, putting a lot of work into its refinement out on the open road. I've got to say that my expectations were pretty high and the CX-8 has managed to meet them. When you come into a corner in the CX-8 and you have to change direction, it is the lightest car in the group and it really feels it. There's a nimbleness and an agility to the Mazda that you don't really find in the Toyota or the Kia. Now, mechanically, the Kia Sorento has a lot in common with the Santa Fe, but it has a different tune. You can feel over bumps like this that it is a little bit more compliant and more composed than the Hyundai. It has been tuned for comfort rather than precision and handling, and that's no bad thing. In a car like this, that is something that should be celebrated almost. Yeah, it hooks in pretty neatly. It feels feels quite good. No, it's not as nimble as the Mazda or quite as precise as the Hyundai, but it strikes an excellent balance between ride and handling that really is evidence of the work that Kia and Hyundai do to tune these cars to Australian conditions. And it is fascinating driving them back to back and picking up on some of those differences. Out on the open road, the Kia's diesel engine is a little bit noisy, but very punchy. Much like the Santa Fe, it has heaps of thrust and it has a great partner in its eight-speed automatic transmission. Big ticks there. 
All four cars have something to offer, and choosing a winner, it's not easy. But if we had to pick a winner today, that car would be the Hyundai Santa Fe Highlander, which blends generous standard equipment with excellent road manners, strong ownership credentials, and a level of cabin presentation never seen before from the brand. Make sure it's on your shopping list.